our mothers, our ministers, amen, to all of, all of you, the Lord's people. Come on, thank God for our guests on today. However, show some love. Amen. Amen. We thank, amen, for, uh, thank them for being with us today on our Family and Friends Day. Amen. We got some family and some friends we can invite. Amen. Amen. I, I, I don't want to put him on the spot, but Mike is here. Amen. Mike, Mike is here. <laughs> amen. I don't want to put him on the spot, but I, it's good to see Mike. Amen. And amen. One of my uh, homegirls that I grew up with. Amen. She lives here. She's here on today. Gwen. Amen. She's sharp, y'all. I'm telling you. Amen. It looked like Gwen been wearing froze since we were kids. I ain't lying. She looked like all her pictures of her and she has a twin jacket. And it seemed like they always had a fro. Amen. Big Afro puffs. And remember those pictures, Gwen? We got a whole bunch of them. Amen. But thank God that they're here with us. I, I, I just thank God that, uh, you know, when you know people when you were growing up and people knew you before you knew yourself, amen, they can tell when God has done something in your life, and you will be the testimony for their life as well. Amen? Amen. And so I'm thanking God for relationships. Amen. Just relationships. People I've known throughout the years. People I've known through the years. And it's something about having good relationships. Come on, somebody. Amen. And I thank God for relationships. Would you just thank God for relationships today? Amen. Rather, it's a relationship with your spouse, the relationship with your children. Come on, somebody. We need each other to survive. Don't make no mistake about it. Long, uh, the Lone Ranger had told Tonto he wasn't by himself. Amen. He really wasn't alone. Amen. He had Tonto, so he really, he really wasn't alone. Amen. We're going to go ahead and get started with our message. If you would go to uh, John chapter 14 going to read from the New Living, uh, New Living Translation, or in our, one of them. New American Standard Bible. There you go. Amen. I got some PowerPoint. Get a little study. Amen. Uh, St. John, Chapter 1, from the New American Standard Bible. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Lord, you have a mighty heart. When you have your breathe, thank you. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Amen. It says, let not your heart be troubled. We've, we've heard this so many times and and this scripture is, is favorably read during funeral times. You tend to hear this during a funeral time. Amen. Division or decisiveness had set in among the disciples. The disciples, Jesus is, he's, he's talking to his disciples because there was some uh, decisiveness had settled in between them. And that's Luke 22, uh, 24 through 30. And desertion and betrayal by one of them was now known Judas had, had, had done his thing and, and the separation from the Lord had been the, the topic all along while Jesus was here. When Jesus was on the earth, all along he kept telling them what he was going to do. I'm going to leave. I'm not going to be here. I'm a, you know. And they, their mentality was so stuck on this earth. But the whole time Jesus walked with his boys, his twelve, he was telling them about the kingdom of God and not the earth. Amen. So in this point where he's saying, don't let your heart be troubled, uh, he's denying Jesus right here had just been talked about. And that's in John 13 and 38. The scene needs to be clearly viewed, even felt in order to grasp the impact of what Jesus was about to say. The disciples were greatly troubled. That's why he said, let not your heart be troubled, because they were greatly troubled. And that word trouble in the Greek is tarahithio, which means they were disturbed, agitated, perplexed, worried. They were tossed about, confused, distressed. Have you ever, 
found yourself, yeah, in one of those words, uh huh. The con, uh, the con, cumulative, Jesus, weight of these revelations must have greatly depressed them to comfort the disciples. Jesus gave them several exhortations along these promises. Notice in verse 1, he said, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. He said, Do not let your heart be troubled. That's the same verse that's translated stirred or agitated. The same verb that translates trouble when you read John 11, 33 and 13, 21 and 14, 27. I overstudied. Yeah, I did. Now, how much believers or how often are we afflicted with trouble needs with the same words of encouragement and help and deliver the same? How many of us need those same words to come into our lives at times where we need somebody to say, don't let your heart be troubled? Sometimes something can hit you so hard that it jumps you. Come on, somebody. That it gives you a blow. Come on, somebody. It hits you. It side hits you. You know, nothing like a fishtail hook hit when you... Going down, if you're going to get hit, people say they'd rather be hit where they can see it, but somebody just hits you from the side and you've never seen it coming. And how many have ever been in a situation where I didn't see it coming? Have you ever heard or been going through something that had you at the point of depression or, or desperation? Is it your family? Is it, come on, is it is your, your finances? Is it the stuff in your past? Well, the disciples needed to be settled down and given some sense of peace to receive some encouragement and some new hope. God sent me to at least one person. I know there's at least one person in this place this morning to let you know that even though you have some stuff on your mind, the word of the Lord comes to you this morning and says, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Amen. Tell your neighbor, I'm dealing with some stuff. Yeah, I'm going through some stuff. Tell your neighbor, I'm going, I'm going through, yeah. Everybody going through something. Woo. Everybody in here, amen. They have something that they're facing right now that's troubling. Some of y'all didn't sleep well last night because of things that are on your mind. Some of you are not sleeping because of what you've been through over the last month, over the last few months, over the last year. Amen. It's still on you. But I hear the word of the Lord says, do not let your heart, come on somebody, be troubled. Jesus knew his father's house, the truth and the reality of it. God's house is real. It does exist. It is a real world that exists in another dimension of being the spiritual dimension. Its name is called heaven. For it is the Father's house. This world, the physical and the material world, is the property of God. But it's not God's house. This earth is not the eternal and permanent dwelling place of God. Heaven is a spiritual world or a dimension of being the home of God where the mansion of the believers exists. Now the word mansion, let me help you out this, uh, in the Greek means moa or monia, which means an abiding place. Sadly, I hear people always destroying this world, word because of our Western definition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this mansion does not mean it's a huge one. Come on, with high ceilings, cathedral ceilings with a hip roof and bathrooms. Yeah, you won't have to go to the bathroom in heaven. Tell somebody I won't have to go up there. Come on, tell somebody I'm not going to have to. No, it's not the three jacuzzi bath with the, yeah, you going to, all that stuff you want. No, that's not that kind of, of mansion. Come on, somebody. Amen. You won't have to 
uh, shower when you get to heaven. You're going to take off mortality. Come on, somebody. And you're going to put on immortality. Yeah, mansions in Scripture refer to as a place, residence, room, dwelling areas, or spaces for living. What a glorious hope. Uh huh. How much clearer could Jesus be? A place for every one of us. A place for every believer to dwell and to live. Just as we have dwelling homes here on earth, so Jesus promises dwelling homes or mansions in the heaven. John chapter 14, verses 3 and 4. John chapter 14, verses 3 and 4. Amen. Read, Glory. If I go and prepare a place for you. Jesus said, now this is conditional. He's still on earth and he's talking to his boy. And right here he says, if I go. Read the book. I will come again and receive you to myself. Now see, that conjunction, if I go, I will come again and, come again and, the conjunction and, if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself. Oh my goodness. Read so I can explain. Read, sweet. That where I am. That where I am. There you may also be. There so you may also be. Listen, he said if, which is conditional. If I go, how many know Jesus will? He said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive. He said, I'm going to come back and get you and receive you. We know that Jesus is gone. Amen. We know that he died. Come on, somebody. He rose again. He is seated in heavenly places. He's already there. So the conjunction if has already been fulfilled. And since he's gone, he's coming back again. I know you're saying, man, it sounds like an Easter message. Tell somebody, you ain't got to wait for Resurrection Day to, to talk about Jesus coming. Come on. You ain't got to wait till a, a, a Easter bunny gets happy and folks making colorful eggs to tell somebody that Jesus is coming back. Come on, somebody. Jesus said nothing about the nature of the place where he was going. It is sufficient that believers will be with the Father and Jesus. The disciples knew how to get to heaven. He told them, you know the place or the way to the place that I'm going. And throughout his ministry, Jesus had been showing them the way. But as Thomas indicated in John 14 and 5, they did not fully understand. That's out of the Bible knowledge commentary. They did not fully understand. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians 4. 13 through 18, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, New Living Translation. When you get there, glory, please read. And now, and now dear brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died. So you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Read the book, sweetie. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from the graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Notice verse 18, what I didn't realize, because I don't always study, study the School of Champions, that's Pastor Darrell's, I used to jump in there because i got so many other stuff to study. But I didn't realize that this was going on in School of Champions today. So I had excused myself out of here because I really didn't want to hear a lot of it. I came back in on some and kind of ran back out. I don't know, wait, I don't because I have a whole lot of other things that I do. Now notice that verse 18 says, so encourage 
each other with these words. Tell your neighbor he's coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul, yeah, Paul said to encourage each other with this word. Amen. Now, I know that this is injurious and difficult and tired for some of you uh -huh, because we don't hear this anymore. We don't hear this. This is not popular. We, don't, we used to say it all the time, but now we don't say it as much. Look at your neighbor and tell him again. He is coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Tell them to hold on. Just wait a minute. Uh-huh. Everything that you're going through, Jesus is still coming. Come on. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't back down. Don't back up. Don't give up God. Tell somebody he is coming back. Yeah, see, so you hold on. Hold on. God is coming. Amen. God is coming. Yeah, they've been saying that for years, Pastor. You know, when I was a kid, my grandma was saying it. And I remember great granny saying that he was coming back. Amen. And it don't look like he got here yet. Amen. Tell somebody, keep living. Because there's a whole lot of folk dying. Yeah, yeah. That's an indication. See, his return, he's talking about earlier, it's the great triumph. Because we all going to get up out of here. Come on, somebody. We're not going to live on this earth forever. You might as well settle that right now. All of us have an eternal place somewhere. That's why we live to live again. We live this life to live again. Amen. Let me just kill a demon real quick. It's not based on your clothes. It's based on your soul. It's not because you don't wear makeup, all of the lay of Mary Kay. Amen. Some of us need a double dose. Come on, somebody. It don't have nothing to do with makeup. It has nothing to do with your clothes, whether you wear pants or a skirt. Come on, somebody. It has nothing to do with none of that. Joe said, render your heart and not your God. He knew we was going to have a problem with this. Because he knew somebody was going to get in themselves and start putting a lot of legalistic rules on people and say that in order for you to be saved, you got to do A, B, C, D, E, and F. They should have just left the A, B, C's alone. Amen. So people attach stuff to your salvation. And that's why all this stuff is creeped into the kingdom of God. That's why all this mess is creeped into the church. I'm like, you ain't saved. Look what you got on. Let me find how many people out. You going to hell. Look what you got on. Oh, my God, your toes out. Look at that. Oh, you gone. You got on short sleeve. Boom. You got makeup, that necklace, and an earring, and a bracelet. Because people... Have, have, have just watered down church. You'll never water the gospel. It's liberating. But people have watered down church and told us so many things that we can't do. So some of us are still locked in bondage of our past. So when we're trying to get free, it's kind of hard because we're still stuck on what we were taught. Tell somebody the word of God is not bound. John chapter 14, let's go to the book. John chapter 14 and verse 5, amen, tell somebody he's coming back. John chapter 14, verse 5, glory, when you get it, read it, sweetheart. Thomas said to him, mm -hmm. Lord, we do not well know where you are going. How do we know the way? Read it in the New Living Translation. One more. Read it, read, read, read it again. Read, read. Get the New Living Translation. Get one more slide. Come on. Almost like, there you go. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where we are going. So how can we know the way? Now, Thomas contradicted Jesus as spoke when he spoke with skepticism. We do not know where we are going. How can we know the way? Here it's at the disciples thinking that Jesus was about to lead them to set up the kingdom of God right here on earth freeing Israel and establishing it as the greatest nation on the earth. And all of a sudden, he began to talk about some place. In addition, he insisted that they could not follow. But you my leader. There were, of course, thinking in terms of an earthly and temporal government of worldly possession, power, wealth, and possession of prompt and ceremony. This was their problem. Jesus had told them 
where he was going in simple and clear terms. He had said time and time again he was to die and rise again. What do you do when it is not working like you thought it should work? What do you do when you think that it should go a certain way and it is not going in a certain way that you thought? Now, this part right here in these verses, this is where I'm supposed to jump all over Thomas right there. Forgive me, but I feel him. Have you ever asked God, what's up? Don't call him Doubting Thomas because the Bible didn't call him that. I'm so glad that God does not name us after our mistakes. He made a mistake when he said it, but God never labeled him that. Come on. Thomas is confused right now. See, we read the book and we understand. But if we jump in the scriptures where Thomas is, Thomas is confused. He has uncertainty and ambiguity about his tomorrow. Thomas thought Jesus would do one thing for him. And now Jesus is talking about doing something totally different. I just want to spend about half a minute or so preaching on Thomas. Confused people. People who feel dropped. People who feel lost. People who are saved, but you are confused about your destiny. I'll preach to the perfect people next week. As a matter of fact, I'll preach a message, amen, week after next, and, and so on to people that, you know, make you run around the church and break your shoe. Amen. Glory. But have you ever been in a place where God showed you one thing, and it looked like it took you to something else? Have you ever got a word from God... And things look different from the way you heard that word. God saying he's going to do this and you're going to have that and your family is going to look like this and God's going to restore that. And, 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 and just as sure as you look at it, it looks like you made about face and started going in the other direction. Have you, have you ever experienced that? Have you ever had a confusion uh, thought. Have you ever been in that spirit before, like Thomas, where you doubt God? See, God, I don't know if that's really going to happen. God, I don't see it. I've been here five minutes and nothing changed. I've been in this place for two days and don't look like you're working it for my good. And looks like they got the upper hand and I got the lower hand. And I'm praying and believing you and things are turning. I guess I ain't got nobody in here today. I'm believing you for one thing and I'm standing on your word and having all the faith bigger than the size of a mustard seed. Amen. And things still are going in the opposite direction. Have you ever had a Thomas experience? Tell your neighbor God still meant what he said. Yeah, he still meant what he said, John chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Come on, continue to read. Uh, glory, read, sweetie, read. Jesus told him. This is what Jesus said. What did he say? I am the way. Who read the books. The truth and the life. Uh-huh. No one can come to the Father except through me. Read. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, we've been involved in Christology because... I preached coming from Resurrection Sunday all the way over in the Jesus series. I preached on the man, the miracles, and the ministry. You remember. Amen. And what he can do in your life if you trust him. Amen. But verse 6, Jesus concretizes who he is in no uncertain terms. Jesus says what? I am the way. Jesus speaks to his boys and he immediately calms their doubts and their fears by telling them what? I am the way. Come on somebody. Right now I'm almost ashamed of the American 21st century preaching because pastors are afraid to be offended and get sued every day. Pastors, I'm telling you, churches are closing every day. I read Christianity today. I read preachers today. It's so much stuff going on with pastors. And, and it ain't infidelity. All of it ain't because they robbing. Amen. Because their lips are sealed and their hands 
are tied. Amen. And the government, the Bible said the government shall be upon his shoulder. And some of them are in places, in positions right now where they're being sued by the things that they say out of their mouth. So everyone is trying to pre preach politically correct. We don't want to offend the Muslims, so we got to watch what we say. Yeah, we don't want to offend the Orthodox Jews, so we have to watch what we say. Mm -hmm. Jehovah Witnesses and such like. Yeah, yeah, but I'm sorry, Sumi, lock me up because I'm telling you right now, Jesus is the way. He is the only way to get to heaven. He is the only way to get to the Father. Come on, somebody. Jesus is the only way. And if I mess up today, I want you to know that Jesus still is the only way. He's the only way to eternal life. He's the only one that can regulate my mind. He's the only way that can set me free. He's the only way that is able to stabilize a marriage. He is the only way that completely heals your body. Jesus is the only way. Tell somebody he's the only way. I'm sorry, Confucius is not it. I will not compromise. Muslim. Amen. Allah is not it, baby. Jesus is the way. God bless Carlton. I love him. I used to follow Carlton all the days. I would not demonize him. He was an awesome teacher. I learned so much from Carlton, amen, through the years, but I cannot get with this universal reconciliation. Amen. Universal reconciliation states that every person will eventually experience salvation. That's a lie. That's a lie. Go to Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. That's salvation. Uh-uh. Let's read the book. Because I'm about to, about to talk. When you get there, glory. Amen. Jesus, tell somebody Jesus is the way. There is no other way to get to the Father but through Jesus. Read the book, sweetheart, when you get there. And there is salvation uh -huh. in no one else. Read, go back and, 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 and... And there is salvation... And there is salvation, read... In no one else. In no one else. Keep reading, sweetheart. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Woo! There is no other name under heaven. If you're a Christian, you don't compromise it. Now, if you're not a Christian, you do what you want to do. But Christians are Christ-like, Christ followers, and they're on their way to heaven. You don't want to obey the Bible, go do what you want to do. But if you want to be a Christian to go to a heaven that's written in this book, you got to do it God's way. I have to submit, fall in line, and do the same thing. Amen? Read that again from the top, sweetheart. And there is salvation uh -huh. in no one else. I want them to hear it again. Read. And there is salvation uh -huh. in no one else. There's no one else you can get salvation is. This universal reconciliation is crazy. It's a lie from the devil. And I'll tell you again. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. Read, sweetie. For there is no other name. Ain't no other name. Under heaven. I'm going to tell you again. Read. That has been given among men. Why? By which we must be saved. Read. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, 10 and 11. Read. 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 So that at the name of Jesus. Whose name? Whose name? Read the book. So that the name, at the name of Jesus. Yes, ma'am. Every knee will bow. Read, girl. And those who are in heaven and uh, on earth uh -huh. and under the earth. Girl, say that again. Those who are what? Of those who are in heaven. If you're in heaven, your knee going to bow. Come on. And on earth. If you're here, you're going to bow. And under the earth. If you go to hell, you're still going to bow. Read. And that every tongue uh -huh. will confess. What is it going to confess? That Jesus Christ uh -huh. is Lord. To? To the glory of God the Father. Come on, somebody salute your Jesus. Give him some praise. Amen. I'm telling you, you don't compromise. You do not compromise. Every knee is going to bow to Jesus. Tell somebody, if you don't have a knee, if your knee stuck, come on. If your knee act like mine, come on, somebody. You can't bend your knee. You're going to get a knee from somewhere because the Bible says every, every knee. You lost your knee in an accident and they gave you a false knee. You're going to get it back. Because, see, when you take off mortality, you put on immortality, 
then you, you're going to be like him. That's why there's no sickness and, and no disease. And woo, you'll be in your glory. That's another teaching another day. That's another teaching another way. Tell us somebody, Jesus is the way. But not only that, what the Bible says, Jesus is the truth. Tell him, he the truth. He the truth. Young people, I want you to know, he the truth. Amen. He the truth. Amen. We like to run around talking about somebody the truth. No, he the truth. Amen. Jesus, the truth. There's a difference between telling someone about the truth and living the truth before them. The one who lives the truth literally becomes the truth. Out of the preacher's outline and sermon Bible commentary says, Jesus is the embodied truth. And that's John 14 and 6. He is the picture of truth. God not only talks to man about himself, God shows man that he is like the person of Jesus Christ. Man can look to Jesus and see the picture perfect truth of God. Jesus' life was perfectly God. And number two, Jesus is the Christ, is, Jesus Christ is the communicator of truth. He himself, his person, his life makes things perfectly clear. He reveals the ultimately source, meaning and ending of all things. He reveals the truth of man himself and of this world surrounding man. He shows man right way to the truth. He directs us exactly to where the truth is. And he enables man, check this out, to choose the right way of the truth. As my daughter would say, Jesus will never rape you. He lets you make a decision. You've got to choose if you want to serve. If you want to go to hell, Jesus will protect your right to go. If you want to go to heaven, he will protect your right to go. Amen. Number three, Jesus is the liberator of truth. John 8 and 32, John 15 and 3. He sets men free from the great gulf and stranglement which exists between God and man, between man and his world, and between man and man. He sets man free from frustrations which, can consti- which he constantly experiences. He frees man from fear and weaknesses and defects that plagues him. Jesus Christ is the only liberator on the earth. There's no one that can liberate you like Jesus. Tell somebody, can't nobody do you like him. Woo, honey, I got a man, but I tell you what, my man can't do me like Jesus. Come on. Hallelujah, and I'm sure my man can say that about Jesus for himself. Come on. Amen. Can't nobody, can't nobody, mama, couldn't do me like Jesus. Come on. And no matter what she said, she still couldn't do me like Jesus. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Jesus is the truth. Without him, life is one big lie because it's full of deception. When you don't have truth, when you don't have God in your life. See, we were born in shaping and iniquity and in sin where we conceived. So when we got saved, when we, got, when we came out of our mother's womb, we came in sin and we came in as a sinner. So we are a sinner by default. How I many of you got a computer? Everything when you buy that laptop, iPad, computer, everything is in it, is in it based on the manufacturer. In order for you to get it, you got to first purchase it. And after you purchase it, then the rights become yours. You can change the default and rename your computer to your name because now you own it. When you get saved, you, when, you get, when you're born, you are a sinner by default. The only way to change that is to be born again. Once you're born again, your life now click saved, you're no longer a sinner. Come on, somebody. Amen. So if you have not gotten saved, your life is still on a default. Uh-huh. Your your master is still Satan. Until you accept Jesus, Satan is your master. The only way to change that default is to ask Jesus to come in. Because most of us are cultural Christians. We don't want to be Buddhists and atheists. and We don't want to be Muslim or we don't want to be a Jehovah Witness. So we are Christian by culture because mom and them are saved and Granny and them go to church, so we automatically say we're Christians. You're not a Christian because you hang around Christians. No more than you are a car because you stand in your garage. Amen. You can become a Christian when you say, Jesus, I accept you as Lord. And once you get saved, can't nobody unsaved. 
Can't nobody unsave you. Come on, somebody. Amen. Jesus is the truth, and without him, it's one big lie. Without Jesus, nothing would be right. Now, we have problems. I ain't gonna, no, 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 let me, I ain't trying to trick you and say that when you get saved, everything's all peachy key, and everything is all goody-goody, and you don't have no more headaches and heartaches and trouble. That'd be a lie, too. Come on, somebody. That'd be a lie. But he gives us instructions. That's why he, he wrote to the disciples. He was writing to his voice saying, don't let your heart be troubled. Because we're going to be in trouble, but we're going to be in the world. The world is full of trouble. But just because the world is full of trouble and trouble's in the world, you don't have to be troubled. You have to learn how to trouble your trouble, but you'll never trouble your trouble until you get the troublemaker, amen, out of your life. Satan is a troublemaker. Once you get the troublemaker out of your life, then the trouble protector, which is Jesus, will show you how to deal with the troublemaker. But you'll never know how to deal with that troublemaker as long as you are on his side. Amen. Without Jesus, we don't have any peace. There's no redemption. There's no divine healing. There's no genuine love. There is no sanity when you don't have God. And I want you to know that Jesus is the life. Amen. He is the life. Life doesn't start until you meet Jesus. You may be existing, but you're not living. In Him, come on, somebody. In him we live. And the only reason why I'm able to take some of the things that come into my life is because God is in me. He's balancing me, giving me the peace, letting me know. He assures me. He gives me the assurance everything's going to be all right. He assures me because he brought me out then that he's going to bring me out now. Because of my relationship with him and the experience that I have with Jesus, what I'm going through right now is an indication that he's going to bring me out because his record is good and he always do what he said he's going to do. And if he brought me out of that, truly the Lord is going to bring me out of this. Tell somebody, Jesus is life. Yeah, in him was life. And life was the life of man. Amen. Come on, read John. Read, 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 read John, John. Give me John 10. 10, come on, come on, come on, John 10, 10, John 10, 10. Next slide, come on, John 10, 10. Glory to God. Read, glory. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Now, I know you probably got some thief in your neighborhood, thief in your family, but I ain't talking about that. This thief we're talking about, we're talking about the devil. We're talking about Satan. Read it again from the top, sweetheart. The thief comes. The devil comes. Read. Only to steal. He come to steal and kill and kill and destroy. Now somebody said, now that's bad news. That's like turning on the news and every time you turn on the news, boom, uh, earthquake in Afghanistan, boom, Boston mass, uh, mass uh, uh, marathon, boom, Texas explosion. That's bad news. But those are the works of the thief. God didn't do that. The devil is alive. He allowed it. Just like he allowed you to come in the building. He didn't do that. That's the thief. The thief comes to kill, to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. But don't stop there. Tell somebody, don't stop there. Read the book, sweetheart. I came. Jesus said, I can't read. That they may have life. And how it has. And have it abundantly. <laughs> I said, how it has. Amen. Jesus said, I came that you might have life. Tell somebody, Jesus is life. He said, I came that you might have life, and you may have that life, how? Abundantly. In the King James Version, it said, more abundantly. Tell, some, tell somebody and tell them, uh, uh, God gave me life. Yeah, tell them again. Tell somebody else, God gave me life. Come on, the reason why I'm living is because God lives in me. Come on, somebody. The reason why I have my mind is because he gave me life. Come on. The reason why I'm still home is because... God gave me life. Come on, somebody. The reason why I ain't beat nobody up, cuss nobody out, if you cuss, just repent. Amen. Lately. Come on, somebody. The reason why I ain't punched somebody in the throat is because Jesus gave me life. Folks ain't cuss and keep them out of heaven. It, ain't, it just makes you carnal. It just makes you carnal. Just repent. Amen. See, you done went to hell for that in the Pentecostal church. Oh, glory. It just makes you come. Peter cussed and went to heaven. What the mess? Cut off a man's ear. 
Good Jesus. It just makes you carnal, but it don't make you unsafe. Tell somebody, can't nobody pull your salvation but you. Yeah, see. Yeah, can't nobody pull your salvation. If not, Jesus did too much on the cross for you to lose your salvation because you say a cuss word. Come on, somebody. Come on. He, he, he did too much on the cross for you to just, amen, for you to uh, sleep with somebody one time and lose your soul. Repent and forsake. Come on, somebody. Oh, come on now. It ain't easy because the Holy Ghost will always be pulling you back into your rightful place. See, mercy and grace. Because you don't want to be labeled as a fornicating saint. That's not a good label. Amen. Or adulterous saint. Or, you know, all the other things people say. Because you know there are only five sins in the church. Amen. I'm serious. Y'all know it's only five. It's only five sins in the church. Amen. All five will send you to hell. Amen. But tell somebody, just repent and forsake. I got to get out of here. Come on, let's, let's go, to, go to John 11 and 25. I told you I overstudied. Read, read the book, sweetheart. Jesus said to her. This, this is Jesus. Jesus is talking to some sisters right here, Mary and Martha, and they're having a little problem. See, it was at one point that Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, and, and Martha said, Jesus, make this girl get up and do something. Jesus said, listen, I'm not going to do anything to her. This is a needful thing. She's going to stay right here at my feet. I'm going to let her stay right here. And so now Martha and, and Mary is at this situation where their brother Lazarus done died. Okay? And so Mary got an attitude. She got a problem. She mad. Jesus, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Read John 11. And Mary and, and, and Martha says, well, I know we're going to see him again in the resurrection. And then Jesus cuts her off and he says this. Read it. What did he say to Mar Mar Mary? I am the resurrection he and said, the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the one that can get you up and, and cause you to live again. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, this is the key. This is the key. This is what sets you apart because everybody believes. Everybody know, have knowledge, but not everyone believes. Because if you believe, you align your confession of what you believe. Read, baby. He who believes in me. If you believe in Jesus, read. And will live even if he dies. Listen, if you believe in Jesus, though you die a natural death, you're going to still live. That's good news, isn't it? Tell somebody that's good news. That's good news. Now touch somebody and tell them. I'm going to tell you what. One of my spiritual mentors told me, I borrowed this from him, amen, Dr. R.A. Vernon. He said, get a life. Tell him, get a life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He preached at Resurrection Sunday. I said, I'm going to have to bite that one, sir. Amen. Get a life. Amen. If you want to, if you're going to live again, you're going to have to get a life. Come on, somebody. If you are living without Jesus, you are a dead man walking. Yeah. If you're living with Jesus, you don't have to worry about folk on death row. Amen. Because if you're living on earth, walking and talking, you are on death row. You're on death row, deaf man walking. And in order for you to go where God is and to get eternal life, you're going to have to believe in Jesus. Tell somebody else, tell them, get a life, get a life, get a life, get a life. Amen. 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 You're going to have to look at me at verse 8. Go with me to John 14 and 8. John 14 and 8. Come on, let's, 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 let's sum this up. Amen. Uh, read to get ready, whatever. Amen. Go ahead. Philip said to him, this is what Philip said, I like Philip, what did he say? Lord, uh -huh. show us the Father, Woo. Uh -huh. and it is enough for us. Philip was not satisfied with what he just saw in Jesus, nor with what he had received in Jesus. Walking by faith was not enough. Philip wanted to see some astounding, spectacular uh, person. He wanted to see firecrackers, fireworks. <laughs> you know how it is. Come on, tear some tricks, Jesus. Do something else. Jesus seated there before Philip, although the Son of God appeared as a mere man in bodily form. He was not appearing with firecrackers and fireworks. He was not as dazzling and dripping with robes and having splendor and carrying a big old scepter. Glorious person on earth just trying to make up. That was not his M.O. He was not in a spectacular form or a vision as men of old had seen as men usually think of God when they think of a super or supreme universal being. Jesus was appearing and communicating and living as a mere human being. He was being an example for all of us. Philip wanted more than what Jesus was. 
And that's where we get it messed up and we get it twisted. When we want more than what Jesus can give us. When we want more than who Jesus is. That shows us that we still have a worldly desire. We can be regenerated but unconverted. We can be regenerated but not quite come over to salvation. When we still want more than what God has. That's a day you in a danger place. Amen. But notice what Jesus replied. Go to verse 9 through 11. Read, sweetheart. Jesus said to him, Uh huh. Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me? Have you ever been around people, and they, they, you've been around people, and they say, girl, did you say that about me? Or, dude, did you say that? You're like, you're like, I've been around you so long, you should know if that sound like me. You should know if, if, if I, my intention, come on, you should know me. Okay, how many, how many of you said that to your husband, your wife? You're like, hey, come This is work. <laughs> you know, and your kids, you'd be like, your kids, they say, well, mama, you always, you, always, for real, always. Maybe I'm coming down your road one day. You know, your co-workers, you know, you be doing, you take them to lunch, you're real good to them, you're sweet, and all of a sudden they come in there. I heard you say it. You're going, are you serious? Well, this is the experience with Jesus has had. So, yeah, see, he, he went through the same thing that we go through. See, he can sympathize with us. Amen. He said, how long have I been with you? Read, sweetheart. Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? Read, girl. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Uh Uh-huh. How can you say, show us the Father? Read. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. I'm closing this. I'm coming, coming to an end. I know when I come in, that's the first door. Amen. Give me about five football minutes. Amen. Some of you might look like your father. Your parents, your mother, father told you, or your grandma, you sound like your father, you act like your father, you look like your father. But the truth of the matter is what? You're not your father. Come on. But Jesus said he is just like his father and the same as his father. Jesus said in verse 11, even if you can't handle the Trinitarian concept, Jesus said, just believe me for the stuff I've done. Sometimes you just got to believe God in this situation for what he had done in that situation. Come on. You just got to believe that if God brought you out of this, he going to bring you out of that. Come on. Sometimes you got to just believe him for his work's sake. Come on. He said, come on, believe me because of my work's sake. This is why one of my most favorite quoted scriptures, amen, and I'm almost done. He said, what did he say? Matthew 5 and 16, amen. He said, let me... Let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? They may see your good works and glorify the Father where? You have to do something so that they can see it so that God can get the glory out of your life. Come on, somebody. There are some things that you do that God intends for you to do so that you can let others see God moving in your life and God can get the glory. Come on, somebody. Amen. Remember the song they used to sing and they sing it at a funeral and I went to a funeral last week. Amen. It says, may the works that I've done, come on, somebody, speak for me. Amen. When you feed the hungry, amen, those are good works. Come on, somebody. When you feed the club, when you feed the hungry, those who don't have those are good works. When you give a drink to somebody thirsty, that's a good work. When you visit the sick at the hospital, that's a good work. When you go into the prisons, go into the neighborhood, go into the nursing homes, the convalescent home, go into your neighborhood and visit your neighbor, that's a good work. Tell somebody those are good works. Yeah. Those are good works. Tell somebody that's something good. Amen. The genuine, and like I said, I'm cold. The genuine believer, you've got to believe that everything 
Everything that God ever said that he's going to do, he's going to bring it to pass. Believe God for his work's sake. What God has already said that he's going to do, he's going to do. If he told you he's going to do it, he's going to bring it to pass. Right now, we have a responsibility to let our light so shine before me that they may see our good works. Come on, because somebody's heart is troubled. Somebody don't know Jesus like you know him. And you can say, it's going to be all right. But do you not know your life is example to them that everything is going to be all right? Because if the truth be told, when we didn't know Jesus and somebody said that, we grabbed hold to what they had. We held on to the words that came out of their mouth because of their experiences with Jesus. So this, this week, when you go, you take that word with you. Let not your heart be troubled. You're going to run into somebody that you're going to have to tell, don't let your heart be troubled. God's got something better. you got to go through to get to. Amen. Come on, stand. No, don't stand. Don't stand. Don't speak this coming. Speak this coming. I want to say stand. Today, we just have to, 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 I want you to think about something. I want you to think about something. Some of you under my voice know the Lord Jesus Christ. Get up and not know him. Have a step in him because everybody say they know Jesus. You know Jesus? Yeah. Spell his name. No. But, you know, some people say, and, and I was saying that when I said spell his name. And they was like, J-E-S-U-S. I said, yeah, his name is Jesus. But Jesus has a nickname. Do you know what it is? He was like, okay. I said, yeah, he's comforter. His name is Keeper. His name is Healer. His name is Deliverer. Amen. His name is Lord. He got a whole bunch of nicknames. See, when you know Jesus, you personalize him. He's my deliverer. He's my provider. Amen. You nickname Jesus. Amen. So when you say, you know, somebody, when, when I say, somebody say, you know Gloria? I say, you know Glory, because her name is Glory. And I say, you know Glory? They say, yeah, I know Glow. You see what I'm saying? They know her nickname. Just like Risa. I say, you know, you know Risa? They go, yeah, I know Risa. Because when you really get in a relationship, you nick. Come on, somebody. So when I ask people, do you know Jesus? They say, yeah. I say, well, what's his nickname? Because you get so close to him, you call him nickname. Amen. You nickname him. It's like he and I, we close. His name is Daryl, but I call him Punky. A nickname. Because of the relationship. Today, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your heart's going to always be you're going to always be troubled. The only way, like I said, you're going to still have trouble, but it's something about knowing him in the midst of your trouble. He knows how to smooth your doubt, and he knows how to calm your fears. Sister Rita is going to come and minister to us for our altar call. Thank mm-hmm. you. 